It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to the cleverly titled The Phil Ferguson Show. First beef for today, audacity. Why? Why do you do this? Why do you fuck around with these settings? Uh, sometimes when there's updates to audacity, they, they tweak some things. And I'm sure on the whole, it's for the greater good. But uh, there's a little button you can select to set the sensitivity for the uh inbound microphone and sometimes that stays where it is which is how i want it for months and months and years and then sometimes like one of the recent updates it it changes to an alternate number and when i get ready to start recording it doesn't look like i'm loud enough and i can't figure out why and i go oh my god that that thing is wrong again okay i'm good we have a lot of good stuff in the show today uh, of course, if you like the show, you can go to patreon.com slash fill and show a little love there. A dollar, five dollars, six dollars and sixty six cents if you'd like. Um, that would be appreciated. Of course, the other thing, leaving a five star review somewhere. I'm only aware of Apple podcast and Stitcher, but that would be great. I love those. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple things that we have coming later in the show. I have an interview with John. And he is someone who left religion. So from time to time, I like to have those stories. I have some new information about the Schwab slash TD Ameritrade merger, which for most of you, it's just interesting information about the industry and how things happen. But for clients or prospective clients, it might be more useful. So we have that coming up. And then just kind of on a whim, someone sent me an email about uh, Harvard University of Harvard and its endowment and how big it is. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, one of the things I want to cover right now before we get into segments, and, and I'm just going to throw them in the intro because they either just happened or I think they're small enough that I can cover it here. Uh, the first is uh, someone wrote an email and said, Phil, can you talk about SPACs? Again, the letters S P A C. And that stands for a special purpose acquisition company. This is a weird thing that uh, it actually came up in the conversation about, I think it was ChargePoint, one of the uh, U.S.-based national uh, countrywide car charging companies. I think it was ChargePoint. And they got bought by a SPAC or they bought each other. I don't know, whatever. But. An SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Company, they create a company, they, somebody, creates a company, registers the company as an SPAC, and the company has, well, at least to start with, one purpose, to collect money, and they sell shares. And it may be just from a one-time IPO, and it may be to five people, it may be open to the public, whatever. And they collect money, sometimes millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. And the in, the company does nothing. It doesn't fabricate. It doesn't provide service. It doesn't do anything. It just collects money. That's the first half of their purpose is to collect money. The second half is to buy somebody. And I guess kind of how this works is that if you have a small company and you want to go public, it can be very time consuming, very expensive, very labor intensive for a lot of high ranking people in the company, especially if it's a small company and you have costs and fees associated with going public and the risk that going public doesn't work. But when the SPAC shows up and they have a whole bunch of money, 
what what they will do is they will let's say they have fifty million dollars and they agree to buy your company for forty eight million dollars. Well, forty eight million dollars becomes yours, but then they own forty eight million dollars worth of your company or the entire company in some cases, and it allows a small company to be technically bought by a company that already is theoretically publicly traded and poof, they went public and the founders, the owners, the management team, and everybody can just poof overnight become uh, a public company. And if they own shares in the private company, they get a whole bunch of money. And so that's kind of how those work. And they've not really been big to my knowledge, but it's something that has exploded in size. Um, And the question from the email was specifically, should I... Should I invest in one of these? I say no. That's not going to surprise the average listener. Uh, often I am painfully boring and painfully conservative in the way that I invest. Because when you buy shares of an SPAC, who's who's running it? Do you know them? What are they going to do with it? Because often they don't have any kind of restrictions. They just collect money and then start looking for something to buy. Um, and so it's kind of like you're buying a random stock in advance without knowing what the stock is. So I don't even like the idea for most people of buying individual stocks in the first place. And if you were going to buy an individual stock, I would insist that it be a very small percentage of your population of your portfolio, 5% or less. 10 if you really know the company and you have confidence in its future and things like that. But here you're buying something that does nothing and it it has up to two years to continue doing nothing before it has to be invested or they give all the money back. Now, depending on who's running it and what their purposes are and what their benefits are, could they ever get into a position where it's better for them, even though it may not be better for you to buy something, to buy anything? no matter what the price, just to complete and close the special purpose acquisition company. I I don't know. I don't know enough about it. Uh, And so that that triggers another one of my rules. If I don't really fully understand, I'm going to stick with what I do understand. I'm perfectly happy with a long and gradual, slow, give or take 10% per year. That works. I know it works. It's not fast. It takes time, but I know that it works. Historically, it it works. The data all says it works. This is something where, depending on what they buy, you could make a whole lot of money, you could lose a whole lot of money, and you have absolutely no control whatsoever in how this thing turns out. And so it's like betting black on a roulette wheel. Sometimes you'll win, sometimes you lose. But on the whole, on average, do you just break even? Uh, I don't even know what if there's any rules on the uh, expense regulations on these kind of companies because somebody has to run it. What do they get paid? Um, do they take out more than they should? I don't know. But that's that's what a SPAC is. If you get presented with the opportunity to buy shares in an SPAC, you know if that's something you want to do, go for it. But I was asked my opinion, and my opinion is, no, don't do that. Don't do that unless you really, really know and understand what you're doing. And if you think you're in that category, let me know, because maybe I can have you on to talk about it in a much more intelligent manner than I am. But for the average investor, do not do this. Stick with what we know works. Buying and holding stocks, many, many stocks using incredibly low cost and tax efficient uh, stock index funds and put most as much as you can a reasonable amount uh, utilize I guess uh, IRAs Roth IRAs 401ks 403bs uh, whatever you can find to get tax privileged uh, status because you can you can save a lot of money or dramatically reduce your expenses that way so that's some thoughts on SP a C's Another little housekeeping subject while we're on the issue of doing these little things here in the in the beginning, I have received a lot of emails. I, I don't even know what show it was now. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple shows ago, I sat down with an actual 
client portfolio and just kind of walked through my thought process of how to generate cash for their ongoing monthly withdrawals because they're in retirement. And the number of emails I got about that was delightful. And people really, really liked that segment. I was kind of surprised. But if there's something that you want me to talk about, if you want me to do another one of those, because I do them all the time where I look at someone's account that is either adding money or, or holding still or taking money out. And I have this complicated, complex thought process that I go through. And it's one of those things that I, I'm not comfortable with trying to automate what I do. So I have a limit to how big I can be, which is a problem, but that's okay. Uh, I really like what I do. And I think it's very beneficial to the people that I help. So, and hopefully they think the same because otherwise, uh, why in the fuck would you keep paying me? But, uh, thank you for all the kind words on that. And if you want me to do another one of those, send me an email, Phil at Polaris financial com. Of course, if there's another subject, like just a couple of minutes ago, SPACs, whatever it is you find and you think, uh, you want to know more about it, I can either respond to you via email or maybe I make a little segment on it or just cover it here in the opening comments. Uh, so thank you to everybody who enjoyed that segment in particular. Another topic that I've gotten an email about is uh, money books for kids and or podcast because sometimes my podcast is not friendly enough for children to listen to and it does sometimes have a lot of complicated stuff. Uh, but someone had asked about that and then before I could even come up with an answer, not that I was going to come up with an answer because i really busy right now, which is good, good, good business. But, uh, they came back and, and suggested, um, a series of books called money bunnies. I have not gotten any of these or read them, but, uh, the, uh, emailer seemed to think that they're pretty good. It looks like there's a whole part of a series about how to save money, how to invest money, how to spend money. Uh, so if you have kids and you're looking for something, I don't know that I can recommend them yet, but go check it out. Uh, take a look at reviews. If you happen to buy one and you think it's awesome, let me know um, because then I can either uh, make the effort to buy one and review it and, and check it out. But uh, um, if you're looking for something for kids, the best thing I know of so far is what a listener suggested a uh, book series called Money Bunnies. So go check that out and let me know what you think. All right. Another topic. Wow. I did tell you it was going to be a grab bag of stuff. Uh, vaccinations. So my wife and I, we got our first dose of the Pfizer. We had to drive to Springfield, Illinois, three hours down and three hours back. And in another week and a half, we go for the second dose. Uh, the first shot, no side effects at all. I'm hoping that's the case with the second shot. Although I have heard some people have problems with the second dose, but I don't know. It could be that 80 or 90% of the people have no problems with the second dose. And they don't make posts about it. And then the posts don't show up in my Facebook feed because it's not interesting. Uh, whereas someone uh, with the, I don't know, side effects is more likely to post about it. So uh, the other thing, of course, in case you are a client and try to reach me the week of, what is this, April 4th through 10th, I'm going to be hard to reach. My wife is going to have uh, a surgery. And so I'm setting aside time to help her get ready for that and to recover from that. And of course, at the end of the week, we've got to go probably back to Springfield, Illinois to get our second shot. Maybe I'll have side effects and not want to interact with other humans for a day or two. So it, it might be a little long for the next podcast again, like uh, this one. Uh, but I did have an email from somebody who was, I guess, always is a veteran of the U.S. services. Uh, they called their local VA and got in for a shot right away. So if you were in uh, one of the branches of the armed services and you haven't been able to find a place to get a vaccination, they suggested checking out the VA and maybe you can get your shot that way. And I guess one last thing for the intro, if you happen to hear this show right when it comes out at the very end of April, there is the American Atheist 2021 virtual convention. I was hoping I had more uh, details to give you, but I don't. Um, if you go to the webpage, I, I think the registration is some nominal amount of money. 
uh, there's going to be presentations, activities, things to go check out. Uh, I think I read something about meeting people in your state. So maybe there's a, a breakout session where uh, each state might have a room to, to go talk to people and make friends or uh, start some state level activities. So go check that out, the American Atheist Convention, because it's online this year. There's no in-person. I'm I'm hoping by the fall we can do some shit in person. Um, the Biden administration has done, I think, an amazing, an amazing job at ramping up vaccinations, which was something we should have fucking hit the ground running back in December because the previous organization, the previous administration from the one who shall not be named had nine fucking months to prepare for what was coming and uh, like everything else fucked it all up i'm still bitter about that but anyway god that's a lot of shit for just the intro so we're going to take a little little break and go into the actual planned topics for the show and i know you're gonna like it all i'm sorry but i don't want to be an emperor that's not my business I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed. The bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate. Only the unloved hate. The unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery. Fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke, it is written, the kingdom of God is within man. Not one man, nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines. The power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful. To make this life a wonderful adventure. Then, in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world. A decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason. A world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. It's time for a TD Ameritrade update. 
And just in case you didn't know, Charles Schwab bought TD Ameritrade, and this has been going on for a while now, a year or two, but it actually became official October 6th of last year, 2020. And still, uh, as far as I'm concerned as an advisor and uh, clients of mine and most people that use TD Ameritrade, not much has really changed. And as I expected, they have other areas of the business that they wanted to work on first, and they've been doing those things. Uh, they just had a webinar today for advisors, which was very helpful. They've, they've been pretty good, actually. Most of my experience with mergers has been as an employee, and we all know what happens when employees, uh, two employees, when companies merger, uh, whatever happens is going to not be good for you. But in this case, so far, everything has been good. They've been very clear about what time frame is and what processes are. And it looks like at this point, anyone who's a client of mine, uh, that and we go through the TD Ameritrade uh, advisor or in TD Ameritrade institutional, not the retail side, the institutional side, you probably still won't see anything for five or six months that would even tell you that anything's changing. Uh, so maybe late in 21, maybe early in 22, depending on how other things progress and when they want to make changes for us. The uh, They did say in this uh, webinar that I went to that they have every expectation that the vast majority of accounts will transition without any additional work on your part or my part, which is very exciting because there is always the possibility that because you're switching from one account to another that you would have to open up all new accounts. And so if I have a couple, I might have uh, two IRAs, two Roth IRAs, a joint tenants account. And I was worried. I didn't want to fill out five new applications for every five, uh, every client I have, or for some clients, they have told us that they have expectations that everything will move over without doing any extra paperwork. So that's very exciting. So it should be, I hope fairly seamless. Uh, they didn't discuss the one question I thought of after this webinar finished was will account numbers change? I don't have an answer on that yet. But uh, probably the first thing you'll notice is all of a sudden on the top of your document, it will say Schwab instead of TD Ameritrade. And the, if you get anything in, online or printed out, it might have the Charles Schwab light blue accents instead of the bright green from TD Ameritrade. So that you'll notice that. But hopefully everything goes over and we don't have to fill up uh, new account applications. We don't have to fill out any transfer documents. Um they did say that there might be some account types that might need additional paperwork. I have no idea what those are going to be, but if I had to guess, it might be for a trust account or a 529 or 401k. I don't know. Maybe all of it, maybe everything will go over, but they did seem to be pretty confident that the bulk of the accounts, the normal accounts, uh, taxable accounts, individual account, joint tenant accounts, IRAs, Roth IRAs, um, simple IRAs. Most of that stuff is just going to transfer over in one day. It'll say Schwab on it instead of TD Ameritrade. If I learn that any account numbers are going to change, I'll let you know as soon as I find that out because if you have anything linked to your bank, it might break that. But I don't know what they're going to do with that yet. I'm optimistic that the numbers won't change. The account numbers are long enough that there's probably not overlap. And it might just be that a few people have to change account numbers. Again, I will let you know uh, if and when I know something new. So that's kind of a, a little bit of information on the Charles Schwab TD Ameritrade merger. Uh, for all of your concerns right now, there is none. Nothing for you to do, nothing for you to fix, nothing for you to worry about. Just kick back and enjoy life. And we'll get on with something else for the show. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Your investments should be based on your situation, and you should consult with your financial advisor before taking any action. The show may contain ads. 
these ads are placed into the show by the hosting company after I finish recording and editing. I have little control over the content of the ads, and you should not assume that I support their products or claims. If you choose to support the show via the new Patreon page, that support does not create an advisor-client relationship. This Investing Skeptically segment is about the Harvard Endowment. And I'm not going to talk about what they invest in. I'm just going to talk about the size of it. Uh, a friend named Jason, he'll know who he is, suggested on a post that Harvard had so much money in the endowment that they could pay 100% of all the costs for students forever. And I thought, really? That, that seems like a really big amount of money. Let's go look at it. So a few steps later with the Google and uh, Wikipedia as a source, uh, Harvard Endowment is around $41.9 billion. Not millions. We didn't think it'd be millions, did we? But $41.9 billion. Now, of course, it sounds like a lot of money. Of course, it is a ridiculously huge amount of money. But they can't spend it all in one year if they want to provide money for students forever. So we have to keep that into account. So I use the 4% withdrawal rule, which I suggest to people who retire early, definitely before 62, you start with 4%. You could always go to 5% or some other percentage later in retirement. But since we want this to really truly last in perpetuity and be able to adjust with inflation, I am going to only withdraw 4%. And that is $1.676 billion. Now, we have that number. And then I went and tried to look for tuition. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to look just for tuition. I'm going to look for tuition, uh, room, board, books, lab fees, everything. Best guess I could come up with uh, was about $73,800 per year. I didn't include any travel costs to get to the university if you live in a different part of the country or another country. But it's a it's a working number. Probably that number is high because I think university tuitions are kind of like hotel room rack rates where that's the highest it's going to be. I mean, if you just show up with piles of money of your own, uh, you're going to pay $73,800. But uh, the real cost is probably something... A little lower and then of course endowments and scholarships and grants and aids can help lower from there but seventy three thousand eight hundred dollars using those numbers I came up with a calculation that said the Harvard endowment paying that amount of money could then pay every single cost room board tuition books lab fees etc for about twenty two thousand seven hundred and 10 students. And according to Wikipedia, the current total enrollment, enrollment at Harvard is 20,970 students. So facts appear to be confirmed that the uh, Harvard endowment is large enough to pay forever in perpetuity every and all costs of attending Harvard University for every single student that currently goes there and could in the future go there assuming they kept the same number of students. Now, the additional thought that I had is a lot of people that go to Harvard can afford to pay to go to Harvard, not everybody. So I'm just going to suggest that the endowment pay on average half of all the costs for every student. So really wealthy families with $50 million dollars they still pay the full rate. Someone who gets in and has a, a single parent, maybe or two parents working and making 30 or 40 grand a year, they get pretty close to 100% covered. So on the average, it would be about 50%. If the Harvard Endowment did as I suggest, they could pay on average 50% of all costs for every single student for every year in perpetuity in even have room for some inflation, they could additionally pay 
a $1,000 a month universal basic income payment for approximately 70,000 U.S. citizens. So I think that the endowment is big, bigger than it needs to be. Should it be taxed? Should it be taken away? Should they just do the right thing? Should they share uh, some of that wealth? And it's not crazy sharing here. I'm talking about 4% out per year. 2% covers easily half of the cost on average for every single student. The other half of the 4% or just 2% of their portfolio could provide universal basic income of $1,000 per month, $12,000 per year for 70,000 people. So I'm going to agree with the comment my friend Jason made that that to me constitutes as hoarding and they should be very careful because perhaps a great big fire breathing dragon will show up soon to take over all of their gold. As you get older, you just ditch certain things as you get older, and it's a pleasure to do, right? I mean, for example, right, religion is a very good app. I would be a very spiritual man, right? I don't believe in God, right? Still Catholic. Because <laughs> there's nothing you can do when you're Catholic. Once you've started Catholic, frankly, there's no real way to stop being Catholic. Even not believing in God isn't regarded as sufficient reason to get out of the Catholic Church. Think it'd be fairly fundamental to the whole thing, but no, Catholicism, the stickiest, most adhesive religion in the world. There's no website you can de register online. You can't put up your membership card in front of a priest to go, Feck yeah, I'm out of here, and walk away. You could join the Taliban. You'd merely be regarded as a bad Catholic. I'm presuming a large chunk of you probably were raised Protestant. Give me a cheer if you had any Protestant upbringing at all. Of it right now, when you do the wafer thing, right, and take the, the hoax or whatever, thing, it represents the body of Christ. It's a metaphor, it's a symbol of the body of Christ. Oh, not when you're Catholic. When you're Catholic, it is the body of Christ. You suppose actually believe that it turns into the flesh of Christ in your mouth. Nobody fully explained this to me as a child. I would have spotted the floor relatively quickly in that. Right? I would have gone, hang on, I might be eight, but I've eaten enough burgers, chicken McNuggets, right? fish fingers and rashers to know there is no animal flesh in the world that jams itself to the roof of your mouth and hoovers all of the moisture out of your body until you're looking at your mother going can I hang it down with my finger I'm not going to move in my mouth and she's going do not take it down with your finger it's the body of Christ leave it where it is and make a show of me in the church Desiccating me from the entire land. Desiccating, by the way. Uh. All right, everybody. Welcome back. As promised, I now have John from Arizona. We're just going to call him John from Arizona because uh, there's some complications that he doesn't want to have to deal with in his life. But he is going to share us uh, his story and talk to us a little about uh, his adventures in religion. John, how are you today? Hi, I'm doing very well, Phil. Thank you. Excellent. I, I'm assuming yeah. it's slightly higher than freezing where you are now? Uh, it's currently 89 degrees in the middle of the day. I see. Uh, yeah, it's pretty beautiful. This is the time of the year that we love here. I, I can see because I, I would imagine 89 and it's a dry, not heat. Yes, and that really is true. <laughs> Like 89 degrees, you know, you can walk around. It's very comfortable. It's not like 89 in, let's say, Chicago or something like that. Yeah, I, I might move to a place like that, but I, I don't like the 115s. That, that Those are uh, oppressive. That's the trick. Most people uh, that, that, you know, I've heard the way to do it right is you live uh, here in the winter and you live elsewhere in the summer. So we have a, a lot of uh, winter visitors, we call them. So the population in my neighborhood about doubles at this time of year. Wow. Very, very nice. Uh, and so I don't have a whole lot of detail about your story, but I, I like stories that kind of go chronologically, at least for the format of a podcast. Um, wh how were you raised? What was, the, what was going on in the house? 
Sure. So um, I was raised Catholic. Um, I was born into a family that was uh, 100% Catholic. So the, my one side of my family was pure Italian, the other side pure Polish, and um, and kind of raised in a time when uh, people lived in neighborhoods of, uh, that were related, you know, from, from people from the old country. Yeah. Um, so it was, um, I was surrounded 100% by by Catholics, family, uh, friends, neighbors, everybody. So, you know, as a, as a young person, that, and, and I went to Catholic school, um, so that's all I knew that existed in the world. I had no idea there was uh, any other type of person, let alone another type of Christian. Um, so, so that was, it was a very closed world for me. Well, that, that, did that make it nice in a kind of a way, because it was simplistic? Honestly, yes. Um, yeah. You know, I whenever I tell people that I have a Catholic background and went to Catholic school, you know, they always ask with, uh, you know, kind of under their breath, like, ah, how about those priests, you know? And I, I say, I never uh, in the, you know, let's say 15 years that I was heavily involved in it, um, that I ever have a negative experience with anybody in the church itself. And I honestly, to this day, I believe that most people are trying to do the right thing and that's just the only way they know how to do it, you know, because that's the way they were taught. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I would say overall it was a great experience. Um, but, you know, the conversion didn't come from any negative events inside the religion itself. Yeah, but I, I'm sure you get the occasional questions like I've had over the years. What, what happened? You know, right. when they're just like, <laughs> what, what, what made you turn away from God? Uh, you know, why are you so angry? And uh, my my thing is kind of similar to yours. I I never really had problems with the uh, the Sunday school and the youth club that I was in in high school at the Methodist Church. It did it, it was all nice. I had fun. Yeah, I I felt the same way. There was nothing wrong with it per se. Um, I think what I think what happened was uh, education fundamentally. Um, so the the more I learned about the foundations and the history and the other other types of um, denominations, the more I realized that, you know, the, this, this being the one true, you know, religion that didn't make any sense to me anymore. Um, I, I had a, a really specific event that was kind of uh, where everything kind of came to a head. Yeah, for talk me. to us. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if, so for those who aren't familiar, um, confirmation is a sacrament that Catholics do, which is a, it's a confirming of the vows that are taken during baptism. So you're baptized at seven days old, and obviously you can't, you know, speak for yourself, so your godparents speak for you. So the approach is that when you're about 13 or so, um, they say you're now old enough to understand the things that were, that were spoken for you at baptism, so you're going to confirm them yourself. Um, so it's a it's a major sacrament uh, in the Catholic Church, and it's a big ceremony. So uh, big church, uh, hundreds of people there. Um, pretty much everybody I knew, uh, my same age, and friends and family. Um, you're sponsored by somebody in the church, so I was sponsored by my grandfather. Um, and actually, as part of the ceremony, you take you can take their name. So I actually was sponsored by my grandfather and took his name as one of my names. So it's a, it's, as you can imagine, it's a pretty big deal. Right. Um, so, um, but that for me was a, kind of a major turning point. Um, and I always remember the way that I felt because uh, what they do is part of the process, kind of like uh, in a wedding when they get to the point where they get to the vows and they have the, you know, the priest says something and then you repeat it back. They do the same thing during the confirmation. So you say, um, you know, I believe in, in this God, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in the resurrection, um, et cetera, I reject Satan, right? And you say all these things, and it's, I believe, I believe, I believe. And what happened to me during that time, and uh, uh, makes me emotional just thinking about it now, is just a horrible sense of foreboding, like I was the worst possible person I could be because I didn't believe. Oh. I didn't truly, truly believe in my heart. And that felt like, um, like sort of, I don't know, like some, making me some sort of divine hypocrite, you know, that like the worst kind of person I could be. It wasn't, it wasn't bad enough that I didn't believe, but not only 
did I not believe, but I stood up in front of everybody I knew and God, who I still believed in and said I did believe something I didn't. Yeah. That, so that was, that was a pretty intense moment. That can be kind of rough. It, it was funny because, um, I was, I don't know if you knew this, but I was very similar in uh, the Methodist religion when I was 13 and had confirmation. And, uh, a couple of weeks before the whole ceremony, I had told the minister that, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't ready. I wasn't, I wasn't really convinced that this stuff was all correct. And he, he just said, uh, do it for your parents. And I was like, Interesting. <laughs> do it for my parents. I mean, well, why wouldn't I do it? Cause it's true. Why wasn't that your answer? You know, just do it for your parents. <laughs> uh, and so kind of in a way that that completely and totally broke the spell. And I was like, Oh, okay. It's a, it's a game. Uh, so I was kind of where you were, but I had absolutely no dread or guilt in it because I had figured out and the spell had been broken that it was bullshit. But it sounds like you had those, some things you believed and some things you didn't and you had struggles and, and did you kind of get over that and be okay? Or was, was that the beginning of the end? So that was the slow beginning of the end, I guess. Um, so it's, it's tough because of family. Yeah. Um, and I hear this with a lot of other folks, deconversion stories is, is that family is really the toughest thing uh, because they are so engaged in it. They were so proud of me. Um, you know, their expectations of, of me and the religion were very high. Um, so, and, you know, we had um, nuns in both many branches of the family. Um, so just super engaged and religious folks. Um, so I couldn't really, I never really came out uh, to them. Well, I don't know, maybe I never have actually to some of them still to this day. I'm, I'm 50 years old. Right. Um, so what, so what happened from there is I went to a, um, uh, a non-Catholic school, you know, to a, uh, uh, and that was kind of the, that was the slow beginning of the end because there <laughs> we had things like, classes in comparative religion, um, where we read things from the Bible that we weren't told to read, but we were, you know, things that were interesting, that uh, were very, very different than what we were taught, you know, in school and in, in religious school. Um, so that kind of slowly moved me away uh, to, to, I would say, probably an agnostic. Um, yeah, that comparative religion and, class yeah. is, is a cornerstone in many, many deconversion stories. Uh, so you're not alone there. Yeah. Um, well, and, and then, so the, to make the long story short of the rest of it, um, so I kind of just forgot about it, you know, into my 20s, right? I'm a, I'm a grown-up, but not really practicing anything like that, and they just didn't care. And then I had kids, and apparently this happens to a lot of people, too, when they have kids. Yeah. They feel like they need to do something for the kids, religiously, right? So I briefly went back to Catholicism. I realized, no, that's not right. I tried a whole bunch of different things. And ended up at a um, what I call the the off ramp atheist church, which is a universalist Unitarian church. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, <laughs> and because uh, a lot of people there were just like me, right? Um, kind of right on the edge of you know of true atheism, but didn't want to leave all the trappings of the church. Um, so did that for a couple of years, and then you know then I was completely out, and that's where I'm at now. Excellent. And you said some people in your family still don't know. There are some who still don't know, um, some that went to their grave uh, always believing that I was still in the church. Yeah. Um, I had one close relative who uh, made a deathbed request of me to baptize my children. So, yeah, it, it's it's pretty serious uh, in my family. Now, uh, I, I'm fast. For I'm, me, it's come out okay. I'm right. fascinated by this. You, you, did you honored that request in reality, or you just promised to honor it? I'm going to keep that private. Oh, okay. I, I, I understand, but uh, a fascinating thing, and it's, you would not, if you had baptized children as a non-believer, you would not be the first ever in the world to have done that. So, uh, you know, sometimes you do what you have to do to make people happy, um, and it doesn't really hurt right. anybody. Right, well, like a good, a, a different example other than the baptism would be um, weddings and funerals. Right? Yeah. So all of my family has Catholic weddings and funerals, and I go attend all of those. I participate, I say all of the words, I put my head down, I'm very respectful. Um, and I feel like that's the right thing to do to honor my family. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's it's one of those things that, uh, uh, you know, at a family event, I, maybe I'm, I'm a little more reserved, but when I go to something like um, 
a rotary club or or somewhere when they do a prayer uh i'm looking around for who else is looking around (laughs) (laughs) and that's a great way to meet cool people because you look across the room and you see someone who's looking around and you're i point to them like yo you and i'm like yeah and then after the meeting is over i talk and i go i noticed you didn't have your eyes closed and they go i noticed you didn't either so yeah it's a it's a good trick to all the listeners by the way since everyone has their eyes closed and their heads bowed you can get away with almost anything at that moment that is a great idea and i will never tell yeah (laughs) good good fun so uh so how are things now have you gotten past the religion or does it still have some trappings 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 uh traditions that kind of you're stuck with or you haunt you or you think things that maybe aren't true that's an interesting question no i i really think i've gone uh really far past it so so once i got over it with my kids then i kind of got really engaged and this is the time when you know the internet was was coming and there was more information out there in the world and um so i kind of set myself at just out of pure curiosity to learn about the various denominations and the various histories um where i live there are a lot of uh Latter-day Saints or Mormons. Um, so I was very curious about that. Uh, how do you get to that? And what are the, you know, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff behind that. Yeah. Um, but I, and I try to reconcile, you know, so, so I would say myself, I'm basically a hard atheist, right? There's, I mean, you, you can't ever prove that uh, an all-knowing, uh, all-seeing uh, God that works behind the scenes that you can't, that works on an op- another plane, you can never prove that you can, that he's not there but it certainly can operate as if he's not there. I mean, it's, uh, so I guess I would call myself a soft atheist. I don't know what the right terminology is. Yeah. I, I'm not that hung up on it, but I, but I get the point. It's just like, uh, maybe there really is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. No, no, that's just not going to work. And, and it's the same thing <laughs> for me with, uh, with religion. It just, it, it just literally cannot work like people think that it does that that doesn't make sense to me in a modern world where we we know how things work god keeps going into the smaller and darker and farther cracks in our understanding and he hides there and uh that's sad (laughs) that's so sad right i mean it's it's bronze age mythology right Um, yeah i guess where where i am now as i look at it you know from a purely academic and historical point of view and i can kind of appreciate how we got to where we are now and then i i try my best you know as a as a humanist to appreciate how other people are where they are because i definitely know a lot of people who are very sincere in their beliefs and i you know i i i'm not an evangelist uh, of atheism or anything like that oh i am Um, i just try to see their point of view (laughs) from i know (laughs) yeah that's why i listen to you (laughs) one of the reasons yeah um yeah so um but, you know, I try to balance it, so I don't want to destroy somebody else's, you know, world and, and their beliefs. Um, and I, I try to go into it with, um, I don't know what the, the right word is. I try to, I try to uh, be charitable yeah. um, to people's beliefs, right? I assume that they're trying to do the right thing and that they really believe it, even if it doesn't make any sense and it, and it leads them to make decisions that I think are immoral. Um, I, I apply the principle of charity first. Yeah, it, it's a it's an interesting thing when I look at religious people. I often find that the more devout they are, the more problematic, dangerous, scary they become. And and what does that say about religion? Uh, that the more sincere you are, the worse of a person you become. That 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 should bother more people than I think it does. But you know, I'm not in charge. <laughs> well, yeah, because it, it requires you to uh, to to kind of. Uh, cut off your reasoning at yeah. a certain point, right? And say that, uh, yeah, well, that's you know that's what we learned in school and in, in Catholic school, uh, the story of doubting Thomas, right? The the doubt is part of giving you stronger faith, and that is so messed up and so <laughs> backwards in terms of a correct way of thinking about the world. Um, but it creates this you know closed system that you can never get out of. And yeah, I think people that that believe it really hard. Um, can be dangerous because they can do things that they believe is absolutely correct uh, for all the wrong reasons. I I understand. Uh, any other things you want to cover before we wrap up? Because I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, no, I think that's it. I, 
you know, that's uh, um, the essence of the deconversion story. I've enjoyed, enjoyed hearing other people's uh, deconversion stories as well. That's what kind of inspired me to, to yeah. contact you. Yeah, it's not um, something I, I want to do. I'm hoping that somebody will. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I was just going to say, it's some, something I enjoy doing. I don't want to do it every show, but I, I am fascinated as a person. Uh, and maybe this is a little bit of a fix for the fact that I can't go to conventions <laughs> anymore. Uh, <laughs> I just love meeting people there and hearing their different paths and their different journeys and, and where they started and where they are now and how, how they got out. And it is a system that's designed to make it difficult for you to find your way out. And I don't like that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, it's one of the things I've enjoyed that you, that when you've put those on your show, I really do enjoy them. And I guess my hope, about telling mine is if people hear it that they will you know may relate to it in some way and it may you know, in a good way that that might help them you, so. you never know because I, I do have a few listeners to the show and i'm not sure every one of them is an atheist or an evangelical atheist like me um so if it helps one person we've done our job john from arizona <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time and, and sharing uh, that little bit of you so that uh, maybe we can benefit somebody. I greatly appreciate you being on the Phil Ferguson Show. Thank you very much, Phil, and keep up the great work. You're listening to the Phil Ferguson Show. I do hope that you've enjoyed the show, at least a generous portion of it. And the way that you can say thank you is either by going to patreon.com slash Phil and kicking in a couple of dollars every episode, or if you have no money, that's okay. You'll get there. Um, you can go to Apple Podcast or Stitcher and leave a five-star review. Either one would help me greatly and make me feel like I'm doing something useful for people. Uh, the one last thing I did want to cover, I, I think I mentioned way back when in the opening about um, vaccinations and the rate of vaccinations. And I don't know what the rate is today, but I, I think the seven day moving average is now something like two and a half million plus per day, which is awesome. Hopefully that can continue to grow to three to three and a half million now that uh, new vaccinations are being allowed, particularly Johnson Johnson and maybe soon AstraZeneca and I think AstraZeneca is this way, and I know that Johnson & Johnson is its one shot. And so the people that are fully vaccinated can increase more dramatically because only one shot is required. Of course, half the work, half the labor. Uh, just happened to pull up the COVID data tracker from the CDC. Of course, you can Google that yourself and find so much information that it's almost hard to know what to look at. Uh, I'm looking at this on March 30th. And the number of Americans that have at least one dose is now 95 million or about 29% of the population. And if something like 10% um, of the population, maybe 20% has had COVID of some kind, maybe um, we're getting close to 40, 50% of the population that may have some resistance to COVID it's not enough. It's clearly not enough, but you know we'll get there because the percentage of the population that's fully vaccinated, either with the one shot uh, uh, vaccine that only requires one shot or the two shots of the ones that require two shots is still only 16%. Uh, percent. Now, for people over the age of 65, at least one dose is now 73%. And that has a lot to do with driving down the rates of death. Uh, this is an illness that happens to be much harsher on uh, on people who have more years. Not They're not old. They have more years, more experience. Uh, so that's a good sign that we've been able to get that. And, of course, there continues to be an imbalance in a lot of places where some places you can't get the shot and some places they have shots that they can't find enough people to take it. And that's really really frustrating and annoying i think i also heard um biden say that they're going to roll out um vaccinations to more and more pharmacies you know your uh, uh what do we call it uh, 
<laughs> I, losing my damn mind. CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid. Rite, Rite Aid was the name I was looking for. Uh, and other companies like that, grocery stores, Walmarts that have pharmacies. Uh, some of them will be inside. Some of them will be outside in the parking lots as we get to warmer seasons, uh, the warmer season. So, you know, keep looking. If you're in Illinois, I may have not mentioned this at the beginning, but uh, my wife and I found that Springfield, Illinois, is has a mass vaccination site. I don't know if there's anything in Chicago, or at least not that I can qualify for. Uh, and that's how we got ours in Springfield, Illinois. So sometimes small towns in, in uh, very, very Republican counties. Uh, this is not part of the problem from the distribution, but part of the problem of humans being fucking stupid and not wanting to take it. Some of the very red areas have vaccination supply, but nobody wants to take it. I am, though, worried I went to an event where there was people, and I don't know that I've really done anything like this for a year. So, I, you know, I put my toe in the water because I've had my one vaccination. I did wear a mask the whole time, and I tried to stay away from people. And there was only 25 or 30 people, and it was a generously spacious building. And the average age of the people there was a little higher than the average population. But a lot of them were not wearing masks. Now, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't able to uh, interview each person. Have you had both shots yet? So they're probably ahead of me because that was the whole idea of the process to get uh, older citizens vaccinated first. But some people had on masks and they would sometimes wear them, sometimes not, sometimes wear them, sometimes not. I guess that's better than not at all, but not much. So I'm still hesitant to go in places where there are people because there is this waning desire to fight the battles to enforce people to wear masks. Some stores are still doing it, and I'm delighted about that uh, because what the fuck? How hard is this? Just just wear the damn mask. It's not going to hurt you. It's so trivially easy to do, and it may be not even helping you. Fine, but maybe you're helping somebody else. Maybe you have the vaccination. Maybe you can be a carrier. I don't know. I don't know if we know yet how all of this shit works, but what a douche thing it would be to think I'm, I'm good. I'm not going to get sick and I don't give a shit if I spread it to somebody else. So if you can, please, I'm asking nice, wear a mask when you go out, wear a mask when you're going to be around other people. And when we know more and we get the all clear, fine, then you can burn your masks. But Let's just think about other people a little bit more um, than the average citizen is. And maybe my listeners do already do that. So that's great. So I'm going to wrap up. Uh, and like I said, the American Atheist Conference uh, online is in a day or two or tomorrow or yesterday. If you didn't listen to the show right away, hopefully you didn't miss it. And uh, maybe by the fall, we can do something in person. If so, I hope to see you there. Hope to see it something in person. Until then, ciao.
tougher, meaner, tougher. 